Hello, Ewan McNeil, I'm the convener for the MiniConf, and we're going to get started now. Our first speaker is Javier, who's going to talk to us about configuration management, a love story. Thank you, guys. Okay, welcome, everybody. My name is Javier. I'm here to talk about configuration management and about love. It's really tough to go after the, the keynote, so please take it easy with, with me. Um, so what's the story with this story? Um, I've, I think the first time I heard about configuration management was uh, in another great Linux conference, FOSDEM. It was 2010 and I fell in love with the topic, then followed with all the streams about uh, DevOps and um, it happened that uh, I moved to live to Australia and started working for a company, REA Group, that manages uh, real estate.com.au and I've been doing a lot of configuration management since, since then. Uh, the story behind the, the, this presentation was that we had the, the Puppet Labs guys coming one day to our office and ask this awkward question. Configuration management, what are you doing about it? We're like, oh, that's a long story. Started sketching in the whiteboard, and then uh, a few days later, one of my colleagues, David Latz, asked, asked me, oh, we have a slot in uh, one of uh, the meetups I'm running, which is InfraCoders, and said, can you put together a, um, a presentation for that? I said, ah, well, this could be a good story. When is, when is the, the meetup? And he said, tomorrow. I said, like, okay, I'll try to, to uh, do that. So I, I thought, what is going to be the fastest way to get a presentation together? So I had this idea of just writing a whiteboard and taking pictures of the different things that we are doing. So that's what I'm going to be, be doing. So we are going to go through four stories. Hopefully, I have enough time for the four of them. I'm going to try to be quick. So let's start with the first one. Uh, hands up who has been in love at any time. Excellent. Uh, hands up who, who is doing something about configuration management. Cool, a few of you. Uh, hands up who has ever hated configuration management? Oh, we have a few as well. So the first love, everything is going to be perfect. Uh, she is the one, she is the one. Uh, has everything that you need is, is, is the one. So here we go with the story. So up, up in the top left, we have a, a calendar, which is kind of rough days about when things were, were happening in the, in the company. You can imagine it was a smaller company than it is today, probably it had only one data center, it had a small dev, dev team, and it, had, it had a small ops team, typical. Uh, so few servers, the, the deployments were done manually, and uh, configuration was done via SSH, so someone will SSH into one of the servers and craft the configuration. Uh, then the dev team over time keeps growing, 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 requirements makes you uh, want another data center for DR or for uh, running active, active, so things keep growing. And the number of ops slowly grows with, with it. Uh, but the dev team really wants to deploy, deploy fast. And then the, the, we want more features, we want more, more business value delivered, so what, what can we do? So our brave ops go and uh, add your service, start deploying into, into the data centers as fast as they can until they hit a problem and we've we got an incident. Oh, slow down, slow down. We start to get that, that tension between the two, the two groups that we all know about. Everybody everybody is, is, is angry, nobody's happy with what, what's happening. So suddenly someone goes to a conference and comes back and says, like, oh, I heard about this tool, I got in love with this tool, it's called Puppet, and it's, it's great, it's going to solve all our problems. So the team goes and uh, starts implementing it, it's a good team, so they, they start crafting um, a few uh, pieces of code, put it together, they, they push it to Git, then we have a Jenkins job that puts it into, into two Puppet Masters, one in each data center, and then we had a lot of servers that are running Puppet in daemon mode, and it starts pulling that configuration, and configuration gets pulled, and everything is fantastic. End of the story. Hooray, we're winning. But then, Things started to be complicated and try to represent that with the number of, of, of code. 
the number of, of pieces of code that we had in that, that repository. And we tried to make abstractions and we tried to use uh, classes in different, different places and we tried to reuse code all over the place. So what, what happens is you try to push, to push a piece of code and, break, and not only breaks the server that you were deploying to, breaks a lot of other servers that are related to that, that piece of configuration. So then the ops team start with the typical um, talk about, oh, it's an incident, we want to meet over 99.999999, whatever. Uh, this is not going to happen again. We need to do this manually. This cannot happen. Like, we cannot break a lot of services at, at once. So, well, when uh, the dev team comes again and says deploy, please, then uh, the ops team only had one way. It was removing puppet, um, the, the puppet daemon from the servers and do the, the deployments manually. What could possibly go wrong? Um, so the ops team will go and put the put everything in Git, uh, gets pushed into Jenkins, that goes to the two data centers, and then someone SSH into a box and applies that. Uh, okay, that's that's all right, but when when you haven't done that for a long time, then is when you you have starting to have problems because maybe you have updated a, a lot of times in the same server, but you, there's a few of them that you never update. So whenever you want to try to update those, you find that you have 72 changes to apply, and three of them are errors. So what do I do now? I need to deploy. I need to deploy now. So what what could I do? So, someone had a great idea, I will SSH into the box, and I'll make my change, and then I'll copy that into configuration management. What a great idea. Um, yep, commit, uh, uh, well, it's already been done. So, you can imagine this over time, and over time, and over time, gets into a really, really difficult situation. Really difficult to, to manage, lots of confidence, and uh, lots of problems. So. Like, we, we had some configuration management, but it was done probably incorrectly. So there comes the next story, which is the other. So well, now you're having troubles with, with your partner, and you start to think, there's all the, all the people around, and well, why I, I don't start hanging out with someone else, and oh, let's see what's, what's out there, and then you start to have other ideas. So let's first present the problem. So we had a, 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 our increasing development team that wants to deploy, but as we were being, having a lot of trouble with our deployments, then they will want to have a staging environment where they, they can deploy and they can, they can check the things before going to production. Great idea. So the ops team goes, uh, provisions a, a, a bunch of things where they can deploy, and then we have a, a great staging environment. But when you have um, tens or hundreds of developers that want to deploy, then there's a lot of contention into that, into that environment. So they come and say, can and have two staging environments. And you're like, oh, well, I will have to go to whatever is your uh, hardware provider and then buy more team, deploy the team to the data center and everything. So that was not ideal. We had a lot of people waiting. So they, they, like, we are into Agile, so we write user stories, we don't write requirements. So as a dev, I want to test my changes in a prod-like environment as early in the process as possible, and I don't want to be waiting for other, for other people. So, someone had a great idea. <laughs> we created a team called Gandalf. Oh, Gandalf came to the Shire and said, like, I'm going to solve all these problems. You just need to hold this ring and I'll come back later. <laughs> So Gandalf was a, was a project that was put together. We had some people from um, the ops team, we have some people from the dev team, and we have some consultant coming. So a mix of, of everything and what's going to solve the problem. So he came with new powers and new, new ideas, which were, why don't we use the cloud? Cloud is infinite. You can use as much as you want, as much as you can pay. And um, it's not going to be contentious because we can create environments for all our developers. So the idea was, why not? Each developer can have its own environment, so it can test any changes that, that they, they, they want. And then they say, like, well, to make that easier, why don't we write some tooling? And then with this, with this tooling, we are able to, to deploy easily into that environment. So you just can type RVA deploy, and then say, I want this environment that has only the front end, or has only the back end, or has everything. So it could go from a couple of servers to probably 30 different, different kinds of servers and databases. And then the, great, the last great idea was, why don't we implement it in Chef? Because we've seen that Puppet is not working. So we have this other idea, because is, why don't we bring another tool? And that will solve all our problems. <laughs> uh, so yeah, 
uh, Gandalf with his uh, one and we created a VPC uh, into Amazon EC2 and then people uh, were able to, to write their own chef recipes to uh, define all those services that we wanted to use and then using the tooling they could deploy an end-to-end -end environment for example that's that's one there that had everything that they needed in a smaller size than in production and they could do all the changes this is great for hack days so whenever you want to do a change you just go create a full environment hack a li little small thing here and you can see it uh, happening all across the environment that was great and then another team wants to, to deploy or even an individual wants to have a full environment I want to have every server I want to have everything I want to test and could do it oh great we're winning uh, okay now we, we test it we can do stuff now let's go let's go to prod let's see what happens uh, then the ops team, because no, nobody thought about prod, uh, goes and says like, okay, I'll replicate the change that you want in my puppet and deploy it into, into the servers. And yeah, not always work. Can you guess why? Hmm, prod-like. Well, I forgot about a few things here. there. Uh, so, cloud versus data centers, they are not the, the same environment, there's a lot of things that can change. Puppet versus Chef, we are not keeping consistency between the two configuration management uh, systems. Debian versus CentOS, oh, why, why are we going to deploy in the same operating system? Well, that's nonsense. Uh, not the same deployment mechanism. Well, you can guess what kind of problems were emerging from, from there. Uh, so yeah, that, that worked for a long time. That was kind of kind of the strategy. Uh, we, we were finding uh, problems. We, at least we could have as, as many staging environments as, as we as we wanted, and uh, that problem went away. But many others came with that. So we thought, oh, we need to standardize. We need to go with one way of doing things. We want to to get engaged. Uh, so the. the First thing that we should, should tell here is how the, the company changed over that, that period of time. So we no longer had an um, ops team, a dev team, we were following agile practices and uh, DevOps uh, principles. So we, we, what we did is we, we organized the, the company in different line of business that are aligned to different business objectives. And inside those line of business, we have different teams that will be composed of uh, people from different practices. So for example, uh, in the LOBX team one, we have an iteration manager, we have a QA, we have developers, and we have one ops. So they have everything that they, they need to uh, be able to deploy a full project and to create a, a full project without depending on other teams, which was great and, was, and is working really well at, at the moment. Uh, in the other side, we had a platform team, which uh, his um, uh, duty was to maintain uh, the data center structure, the, the cloud structure, and some of the services that these teams were using. Uh, but we were drawing the line at the operating system. So everything about the operating system in terms of uh, keeping security patches or deploying the application or managing everything was done by, the, by, by those teams, uh, removing uh, handover between different, different teams. Uh, in the same time, we started to have our first uh, EC2 production environments in which uh, the first thing that we deployed and was really successful uh, was the, the images of the site. So you can imagine a real estate site, 90% of, of the site is the images. If you can see the pictures, there's no point of having that, that kind of site. And um, we deployed move from the net up into EC2 and we started to have a farm of resizing servers in there which was uh, working really well and gave the business the confidence that we could move our workloads from the data center into, into the cloud. So more confidence on having things in, in the cloud going forward. Um, so what the platform team did was, uh, why don't we provide a um, kind of um, environment that everybody can use, where it's, even if it is in EC2 or is in, in the data center, that has everything installed in that operating system that is normally required by all, by all the teams. The, these are things like, for example, LDAP. These are things, uh, for example, like uh, NFS configuration. This is uh, things like New Relic or Splunk configuration. So everything that is available and that all the teams are using will be pre-configured and installed in an image that you can deploy in both environments. 
that reduces the amount of configuration management that you need to do on top of that when you want to deploy a service and make it, makes it really easy. So what we, what we did is uh, we, we brought up a bunch of puppets that we chunk in, in Git and then we have a Jenkins job again that uh, creates an AMI and a BMDK image and then we are able to test that before sending it to production. Whenever we are, we are happy with that then the, the team will promote it to a stable and then everybody can start using that for their, for their deployment. So it's a tested image that is consistent between all the teams, and that remove, remove some of the problems that I talked before about having uh, about having different environments where people were deploying. Uh, so the process of, of deploying for these teams is uh, we're writing our code, we push it to, to Git, then we have a Jenkins job or a Bamboo job, and that that packages everything into an RPM that can be deployed on top of that that platform image. Again, that reduces the amount of, of things that need to be done in the configuration management layer to make it as simple as possible. Uh, so a deployment looks like something like that. You have, we have a, an RPM with the application, and then we have, we have the platform image. We put them together, and then we push it into, into prod using some um, automation. Uh, when we are happy, we can, we can push, it, we push it first to test, and then when we're happy, we push it to prod, which makes sense. Uh, so there's one, one small bit that is not there. So you have different environments. So you, could, you may want to have different, different configuration variables in those environments. So the, the thing that we were using, similar to, to what other environments like Heroku do, does, is to inject those into, into the servers before booting the services and then having them consume. For that, we, we build what we call a config service, which is just a, a REST API that you can consume from. And it will give you all the information that you need that is related to that environment. That is not going to be packaged in the RPM. That way we can deploy uh, the same image and the same application into dev and into prod and the only thing that's going to change is those small pieces of configuration. At the moment there wasn't anything that we like. Probably if we rebuild this we will use some of the products that are out there like Hira or uh, etcd or well there are many many options for that but at that point ah, let's build our own. It probably wasn't a good idea. So you put all that together, and then you can deploy, removing some of the of the problems that you do, that you will normally normally have in your deployments. Um, so yeah, that's that's the full thing uh, put together. So we have the platform image, the app deployed as an RPM, and the, the configuration. Finally, we are getting closer to to uh, today. We have this uh, idea of well. You know, you have different teams, and the teams are independent, so they don't depend between each other. Why they have to marry the same girl? Like uh, they can, they can make their own their own choices. So we are we are seeing that a lot with um, other technologies, for example, languages. So people are starting not to use the same language for everything. So they choose uh, the programming language that is more adapted to the application that they are they are creating. And same thing with uh, databases and persistent storage. You don't use the same the same kind of database for for everything. So why using the same deployment me mechanism for for everything? So what, what we had, again, the, the kind of infrastructure envir environment has evolved a little bit more. So at, that, at this time, we're 2014, we had um, Amazon creating the region in, uh, in Sydney. So we started to have the opportunity to connect the Amazon region into our data center using Direct Connect. So we had a 10, 10 gig connection directly from the cloud into our data center. And that helped us to migrate applications really easy, which in the, in the long term maybe wasn't the best, the best idea because, as you say, like, uh, uh, when you want to move to the cloud, you want to uh, re-architecture your applications to be more cloud-like. And that connection sometimes was uh, something that it was making the engineers not to think about how to move stuff and how to decouple things between the old way of doing things and the, and the new way of, of, of doing things. Uh, at the same time, we created this, this circle, and it's what, what I was talking about before, is as, as a team, you have the autonomy to decide what are the best options for you in terms of technology, and you have the autonomy to, to make your, your own choices, so everything gets together and decides what technologies they want to use. Uh, and that brings back the, the accountability. That means that every system that you build, you're going to have to maintain it. So you're going to have to think before if you want to use this technology or that technology, how you're going to support that over time. And that comes back to, to the autonomy. You are empowered to do whatever is needed to, to build your services. Then there's all this conversation about economies of scale or 
well, if everybody is, everybody is using different services how are, and is using different technologies, then how do we share? Like as a company, if someone moves from team A to team B, he's going to have to learn all the stuff that this team is, is using. And uh, also, if, um, if we employ people, he's going to have uh, to come from uh, diverse environments. And sometimes there's this, this view of the teams are doing the same thing. They are reinventing the world because they are, they are probably, we have probably 10 different ways of deploying. And uh, the, the idea was, well, we really uh, fancy more the first option, which is having the teams accountable and autonomous than having the economies of the scale as part. So we decided, OK, we know that there's a little bit of ways of doing it this way, but this is working really well for us, so we're going to continue doing it in that way. So some ways that you can try to solve that problem uh, are the guilds and the open source model. Uh, so we proud of ourselves to be a, a sharing culture company where like everybody is happy to help someone else and every, everybody is happy to, to, to teach other people and there's a, a continuous conversation going on. So we have this thing called guilds that uh, other companies are doing as well where like people get together and talk. What a surprise. Uh, so you, you will come there and there's different guilds. So we have a, a one which is called the Ops Dojo, where we, we get together and we practice operational, operational skills and people learn, uh, learn about operations, but there are many other guilds, uh, including uh, things like a happiness guild or a public presentation guild or anything. Uh, the other part that, that we try to use to bridge that, that gap of having teams uh, doing their, their own thing is trying to follow something like the open source model. This is the idea of, well, in the open source world, everybody can start a project and everybody can decide what kind of project are they building. And then there's a community that is built around that and there's a supporting community. And then, like for example, if there are two projects that are trying to attempt the same thing, eventually they will come to agreement and use one. No. The, if they are successful, both, both of them, they will continue doing the, their own thing, but that, that's only if, if they are happy with that. If not, they can switch. So the idea is that through all that sharing and all those skills, we have the opportunity to broadcast what we are doing. And then we have the idea that the best projects will win, and then people will start to adopt those. Instead of uh, having a top-down uh, approach where we were pushing the teams to use the technology that we think is better. So again, coming back to the uh, autonomy, the, the teams are, are happy to see what other people are doing and to embrace tools and, and to embrace practices that other teams are, are doing. Uh, so for example, here's some, some example. What we've seen a lot is now that we're using more and more Amazon Web Services, CloudFormation is, is becoming the base that we use to build our infrastructure. So before, in the data center, in the data center model, we couldn't, we couldn't really decide and we couldn't really change a lot the topology and we couldn't change a lot, a lot of things in there. Well, uh, now the teams in CloudFormation, they can decide what, what, they, what they do and how they build. Well, I need a BBC, I need a load balancer, I need this kind of databases and they can work independently, which is, which is great. And it's replacing in somehow uh, some of the configuration management tool that, that we had before, because it's allowing us to, to um, shape the infrastructure that, that we need. So it covers the, the deployment process, and some, some teams will use the, the platform image to do the deployment and to, again, shorten that, that gap and to use, minimize the amount of configuration management required. But other teams say, like, you know what? In that platform image, there's a lot of things that I don't use. I don't need all that stuff, and that is ma making my, my boot time really slow. And I can cover that easily with uh, my own configuration management. They decided to stop using the platform image and move to an Amazon AMI. And that's totally fine. We're, we're happy with that. Is that maybe it will be more work for them, but they can get better results. And then, again, they can choose whatever uh, deployment mechanism that they, they want. Uh, some people choose uh, Ansible, for example. What they will do is, I define all, all our, my, uh, our infrastructure in CloudFormation, so this number of load balances, this number of servers, these auto-scaling groups, these databases, whatever, and then when it comes to the deployment mechanism, we normally will have a CI server that is running a deployment process, and that will use the configuration management to deploy the final steps of the configuration of that, of that server. For that, continuing in the, in the team one, uh, some teams are using the Amazon uh, CLI uh, to do the deployment, but all the teams, for example, uh, the team three, have decided to build their own tool. Again, coming back to the, to the kind of times where they decided that uh, they can build something better than the CLI and that is more adapted to what uh, they, they need to do and what they, they want to do. 
Uh, so some, some teams ha have created that Kool-Aid, some teams are moving into, into Docker, so the teams that are moving at the moment into, into Docker, they are building their own tool to wrap around, around Docker to make it work the way that we like uh, our, our deployments required to be done. Um, in this case, for example, they're using the uh, Ruby SDK instead of using the CLI. That's totally fine again. And they, they decide that the platform image is a really good idea for them, so they continue using it. And they say like, oh, you know what? I'm just deploying an RPM. I'm not doing anything else. It's so, so easy for me that the only thing I do is just use bash and say deploy this RPM. Uh, so yeah, again, different choices, which I may agree with or not. Um, questions? So we have about five minutes for questions. I was faster than I expected. <laughs> Uh, from the, uh, I think, 2013, you're talking about having images with, uh, uh, I think, everything in, installed that might possibly be needed. Mm. That seems so weird to me. Do you mean that every system had an LDAP server installed? Every system had a... Oh, no, no, no. Okay. So what we have is the client. So, for example, we have an, an LDAP server in the, in the data center, and then when you deploy new servers, they, they may be using that LDAP server for authentication. So what they have is the client configured to go to that LDAP server whenever anyone wants to, to log in. So in the platform image, we're only putting the, the client of, of the LDAP. Does it make sense? Yes, but is it really so hard to just configure it in a configuration management system? So, uh, uh, he asked if it is so difficult to, to do it in the configuration management system. And I think that reverts back to, to the first story, where we try to do everything in configuration management, and we try to create classes that apply to every single system. And then when someone wanted to modify those, they were really scared, because it was touching every, every single system that we had. So we decided not to try to do that. And it was really difficult to test. So it can be done. I'm, I'm completely That's the way we do it. Yeah, that's, that's fine, and you can do it that, that way. With but we, trouble. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but, but you can do it this other way, so this is an alternative that we use to minimize the problems that, that we had at that point. But yeah, there's different, different ways to tackle, to tackle the problem. I think the main idea behind, behind the conference is, the, the talk, is that there are many different ways of doing things. We have tried some of them, some of them have been successful for us, some of them failed. But yeah, we, we had that same problem that you mentioned about having an image where they try to install everything. So we had another team that was taking care of the, of the Windows deployments, and the idea was, well, what about if I put everything that can be needed? I, I have an SQL server, I have uh, everything that I need, so the deployment is really easy and can be used for everyone. But our image was more, much more lean. It was really, really small, only had the, the things that, that really we thought that 90% of the teams will be, will be using. That's analytics and that's uh, logging and uh, authentication on just a little bit of our own customization. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, how do you uh, manage things or secure things like database credentials and your configuration files? Uh, so it's, uh, it depends. There are many ways that we are, that we are doing that. Uh, one of the ways that, that we used to do it, it was uh, through the configuration server. So uh, every environment will be able to ping that configuration service and ask for credentials. And those will be injected only into authorized bo boxes to uh, then be able to, to uh, access other, other systems. Uh, where is the... Okay, this one is going to be the last question. Hi. Uh, one of the problems I see with this kind of approach is that you've now gone from supporting one or two different technology stacks to now supporting 10 or 20 or 30. And, and when those development teams leave or recycle in about six months or a year's time, um, you know, you've now got this huge legacy that you're having to carry. And, you know, you'll have one person in one team saying, well, why the hell did they use Ansible? You know, why don't they use Sol? And, and suddenly it becomes a real burden on the company because there's all of these multiple technologies that are now involved. Yeah, so the way, the, the way that we tackle that normally is, 
I said it's up to the team to decide, but normally there's a bigger unit, which is normally the line of business, which is like that business-oriented uh, unit, where, which will have different streams and will have different teams. So the ownership of the systems are norm normally given to that line of business. So they try to, use, to do some uh, uh, reuse of technologies, and they try to... Thank you. Uh, so, so they have they have the opportunity to do some of those of those economies of scale, and they know that. So they know that they're going to have to support the system over time. So they try to minimize the number of technologies that they use, and they try to find the right people for doing that. So there's some some of that inside the smaller circles. But we thought that the unit shouldn't be the company itself, because when when you make decisions at, at a company level, then you're making them for some some kind of, of cases and, and will not work for for everything. But yeah. That's, that's true. This approach comes with some uh, problems that, that, can, that can be that uh, moving, uh, moving people between teams and uh, like having legacy that you have to support o over time. But that, that comes with the, the accountability part. So we're giving you the autonomy to choose whatever you want. Better you have a plan to maintain that over time. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, please join me in thanking Javier for his talk. <laughs>